Welcome to this virtual classroom, this third in our series on the Lord's Prayer titled, Lord, Teach Us to Pray. You know, decades ago, President Roosevelt had fireside chats. Some of you remember hearing about those in history class. Well, I'm in my church office, which happens to have a fireplace. So maybe this will be something of a fireside class. First, a bit of review to catch up from last week. We talked about how the Lord's Prayer right away gets us thinking about the God we're talking to, the God we pray to. And it helps us, we said, with our desire to connect, to make contact with God, because right away it answers our question, can we approach God with something other than hesitancy or cowering fear? And if we do, if we do try to pray, will God notice? Will God care? Well, the first phrase of this prayer answers that, we said, because, note, Jesus has us call God not some distant, vague force. He doesn't have us pray, oh, vast, disinterested, distracted deity. No, he has us call God Father. We address God with one of the most family-like terms possible, Father. Now, we also said to say Father is to imply that God had a Son. God is a trinity, we say in the Christian faith. The trinity is God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. There's always room for more, though. The circle is ever-widening to bring us in, we also said. In fact, I sh shared it uh, last week how I had had an insight, how when Jesus says, our Father, our Father, it's not plural, our, because we say it together as fellow believers, or at least that's not the only reason. It's also because Jesus is inviting us to join with him in the fellowship he already enjoys with the Father. He beckons us, as Wesley Hill writes, to take our place alongside him, to be kind of a tag-along with him as he comes to God in prayer. Well, we, too, can pray like him, our Father. And we talked about two ways the Lord's Prayer helps us think of prayer. First is communion, like when you say, I'm communing with someone or I'm communing with nature. This, this, um, the, this, this sense that we have that isn't always tied to words. And we talked about that in terms of prayer because God, according to Jesus, is not just, as we've said, some force, but we can employ with this intimate God a simple language, the kind of language you enjoy with a close friend or a family member. We said that prayer takes place not because we're such great prayers, but because God is such a good listener. That was part of the context of Matthew's version of the Lord's Prayer found in the Sermon on the Mount early in Matthew's Gospel. Your heavenly Father, Jesus said, knows what you need before you ask him. He said that as he was giving this prayer to the disciples. So, why be intimidated? Communion with God is possible, a natural, unforced, simple communication with a God who is already interested in you, who likes to hear from you. That's the picture we get. But also, I said, there's conversation. To the gentle invitation of communion, there's also the call to grow, to gain a greater sense of competence in how we pray, in the language we use. And that was more the setting of Luke's telling of Jesus, giving the Lord's prayer to his, to his followers. Remember how one of the disciples said, Lord, teach us to pray. Instruct us. Help us make progress in learning to pray. That was more Luke's context or set up for Jesus giving the prayer. Communion in Matthew, conversation in Luke. Both are important. Today, I want to keep going with that address to God, that way we talk to God or approach God, the term we use as we speak to God. I want to continue looking at that phrase, our Father, but go on to the next phrase also, 
The next part of that first phrase, our Father who art in heaven, or in the contemporary version, our Father in heaven. What does that mean? Heaven was one of Matthew's favorite words, whereas Luke and Mark tended to talk about the kingdom of God, for instance. Matthew, in this kind of reserve on how you speak of God that came from his Jewish roots, I think, he seemed to prefer kingdom of heaven over that more warm and fuzzy term, perhaps, kingdom of God. He seems to share in the Jewish reverence, even hesitancy at saying God's holy name. Matthew liked especially to talk about God as not just a father, but a heavenly father, our father in heaven. Not an earthly father as such, and that's an important clue also in how we pray. Once again, I want to use two words to get at what we're talking about in this part of the phrase, our Father who art in heaven, our Father in heaven. And that first word for today is imminence, imminence, God's closeness. I don't mean imminence in the, th uh, in the sense of something that's about to happen in imminent danger. Uh, I mean the theological term imminence spelled, as you can see here, I-M-M-A-N-E-N-C-E. -E. And that word, imminence, talks about as a way of describing God's immediacy, even his intimacy, his being here, his presence in his creation. And of course, in Jesus, he is supremely close, very present, the word made flesh, John in his gospel said, And the word became flesh and lived among us, and we have seen his glory, the glory as of a father's only son, full of grace and truth. The word became flesh, lived among us, became imminent, and we've seen his glory with our own eyes, John went on to say. Because in the incarnation, in Jesus coming, in God becoming flesh, God takes residence in our world. He takes residence in our neighborhood. God does not hang back. Get, God gets right into the thick of our lives. So to speak of God the Father is to suggest a father like God will likely care for us in such a way that he will not stand aloof. Dwight L. Moody, the 19th century evangelist once said, some people think they're going to trouble God by their constant asking. But he said the way to trouble God is not to come at all. Good word. So sometimes we need some refreshing of our memories about the nature of God. And just even in this very way, Jesus tells us to talk to God, helps with that, helps us reclaim the promises where we have heard about a prayer hearing God, a God who delights to answer. For in prayer, we relate to a God not only of infinite greatness, but of intimate kindness. We converse with a God not only awesomely powerful, but amazingly gracious. A God who not only makes prayer a commandment, but also an invitation. God wants for us to come to talk because he wants to have a relationship with us. God meets us where we are, not where we think we should be or must be. As somebody once said, God bends his ear down to hear the faintest whisper. God comes close. God comes near. God is imminent. That is his imminence. His imminence. That's why God reminds us of, that's why Jesus reminds us of God as Father. But to that word imminence, I want to add a second word, the word transcendence. God's closeness, but also God's vastness, his transcending the world as we know it. God's infinite nature, God's being above and beyond our world. So that's why Jesus reminds us of God as a father in heaven. God is a heavenly father, not an earthly father. 
This God is beyond any ways that we can conceive of. This, that's how immense this God is. In Isaiah, in the Old Testament, through the prophet, God says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Transcendence, above, beyond us far, far beyond our comprehension. That's one of the problems with idols, by the way, why the Bible is so strict about idolatry. Idols are little gods, domestic deities, kitchen, kitchen gods, not the great God. But let's be clear, we're not talking we're not talking about God up there when we talk about God's transcendence. As Wesley Hill writes in his great book on the Lord's Prayer, simply titled The Lord's Prayer, Wesley Hill says, Heaven, as the Bible describes it, is not a far-off place in some distant galaxy. It's not a place at all in the sense that we usually use that term, which makes it hard to talk about for people who cannot imagine existing without taking up space. Rather, Hill writes, heaven is a word that allows us to speak about God's nearness and availability without pinning him down to a specific geographical address. That's a neatly summed up way to bring those words together. Matthew and Jesus appear to be less in in interested in just what and where this heaven is and more interested in making this point. And that is this, as intimate as we can be with God, God is still higher, other, not aloof, but above, not by way of physics, but in his relationship to us. Now, our metaphors and our images fail us, but the point of all this is that God is bigger than we can imagine. Don't assume you can even begin to imagine what God is like. Don't assume that you can exhaust your understanding of God. That's not to make you despair of talking to him, it's, but it is to give all of us humility. I think sometimes we lose sight of God's transcendence. We may go too far in the direction of this intimate closeness to the point we become chummy. We think of God as this blandly, chronically gentle being that really can't and won't demand or command much respect. Kind of a celestial butler. Someone at our beck and call to, to answer every women want. Not a mighty heavenly father. I, I like what somebody once said. We live in times more characterized by blah, that word blah, than awe. And you could spell awe in two ways, A-H-H, -H, like ah, or awe as in A-W-E. Both fits. This majestic, mysteriously wonderful God is above our comprehending. He is above and beyond the limits we might put on him. This God commands our reverent awe. The writer Avery, Avery Brooke tells how when she was 10, just a child, her parents bought a house in the country. She was free to roam the forest lands near that house on the outskirts of any town. Now, Avery's parents had not encouraged her to believe in God, but she writes this, as I wandered over the hillsides and through the woods, I sensed something more, a power, a presence, a power for which I had no explanation. What was it, she asks, in the sweep of the sky, the giant outcropping of rock, the sassafras leaf in my hand? I did not know, but I felt, I felt hushed by awe and quiet joy. What a great depiction. Well, maybe you don't need to be hushed. I don't think I quite want to say that as much as made aware that God is God and you are, well, you. 
I am me. There's mystery here. God's beyond our comprehension. Our Father, who art in heaven, Father in heaven, vast in the reaches of his infinitude, but also close. What if you spent some time this week pondering these two great dimensions of who God is? You could spend a fair amount of time on just that short phrase, our Father in heaven, the vast God of the universe, the vast God of the universe. Well, the bigger our picture of God, the more we will be amazed at how he becomes small, entering our lives, bends down close. God did not have to come to earth, but God did. God does not have to invite us to pray, but God does. Don't let God's transcendence make you forget just how willing God is to come close when you turn to him today, this week, in prayer. Amen.